So good afternoon, everyone. So we will welcome to Tsinghua University Shuasman College. Thank you so much for your coming. So this afternoon, we will have two sessions for our higher education forum. So the first session is the moderator is uh, Tsinghua, the vice president of Tsinghua University and the uh, uh, provost, uh, Professor Yang Bin. The second one will be Dean of Shuasman College, Professor David Lee. Our last guest is uh, uh, Premier Minister Kevin Root coming. Uh, Okay, so uh, let's, uh, let me transfer the floor to uh, Professor Yang Bin for the first uh, session. Let's uh, welcome Professor Yang Bin. Thank you. Thank you. 各位来宾、各位老师、各位亲爱的苏世民学者同学，以及你们的亲友们，以及今天专程到场的各位新闻界的朋友，下午好，欢迎大家来到苏世民学院参加今天下午的论坛。我是杨斌，清华大学副校长
在这几位校长当中，可能写的是最长。有请 Boris。Peter Salovey, Professor Peter Salovey, 耶鲁大学校长，他是一位家喻户晓、大家都非常了解的心理学家。有请 President Peter. <笑> Sir Nigel Swift, 他现在的身份是苏士民书院的纽约主任，但也可以告诉大家，直到今年一月的时候，他还是英国华威大学的校长。有请 Sir Nigel Swift. 最后请上台，我们今天的也是东道主，清华大学校长、中国科学院院士，啊，当然他是化学家，邱勇院士。有请邱院长。嘉宾阵容。今天下午的嘉宾阵容实在强大，每个人都该是主旨演讲啊 ，keynote speaker。但时间有限，为了让我们的苏士民学者们、在场的听众们能够详细的了解他们各自的想法，现在就请他们每个人用五到六分钟的时间，一一的为大家演讲。之后我们进入问答环节。首先有请邱勇校长，有请。So excited! <laughs> we have been waiting for this moment for a long, long time now. But I, I'm sorry, I, I still speak in Mandarin. <laughs> 尊敬的各位嘉宾，各位苏士敏学者，大家下中午好。很激动，我们有在这样一个非常美好的日子，在苏士民书院举行这样一个论坛。苏士民书院我来过很多次，但是这一次不一样，这是我第一次与我们首批苏士民学者近距离见面。我也很高兴看见大家。四月和八月二十四日，在群校的。研究生开学典礼上，我远距离的看到了你们，我也听到了你们整齐的喊出来，用中文喊出来的口号，喊的什么呢？热爱清华，一起加油！<笑>我很奇怪，我没有想到。苏士敏学者的中文那么好，我也知道这段时间你们也去爬长城，是吧？登了中国的长城。秋天在北京是最最美的季节，在中国的话语里面，我们经常讲秋天是适合于登高望云的时候，所以你们已经登高了。但是我想，今天我们的论坛也算登高。我们站在这样一个讲台上，展望未来，这也是未来遥远的事情，但是它非常重要。四天前 ，G 二零峰会在杭州刚结束。从 G 二零的报道中，我们可以看出，当今世界面临的所有问题都有两个重要的特征：一个特征是全球性，一个是复杂性。我相信人类未来面临的问题也依然具备这两个特征：全球性和复杂性。所以，我想未来的世界领导者，他一定要具备全球视野，具备解决复杂问题的能力，具备与别人合作、共同解决问题的能力。我由此我想谈三点：未来的领导者应该具备全球视野。要学会从局部看问题到群局看问题，从区域性看问题到全球看问题。要学会证实和重视差异性的存在，并尊重差异性。要学会包容、倾听别人的意见
，学会站在别人的角度上去看问题。当然，最后要学会与他人一起采取一一致行动。我想，这是全球视野在我想象中所包含的这样一些内容。清华大学，我们致力于鼓励我们的本科生、研究生在学习阶段出国去交流访问。目前，清华大学在校园里。有来自一百一十个国家的两千六百多名留学生，我们与全球四十八个国家的二百六十七所大学建立了各种合作关系，比如我们和 MIT 剑桥大学建立了低碳能源大型联盟，共同解决全球能源和气候变化的问题。今天我想还想给大家讲一个故事，过去十年，清华大学推动了中美。中外大学生教育扶贫活动，十年过去了，总共有六百七十多位来自美国和英国的大学的同学参加了这项活动。我很高兴看到了二零一六年参加暑期教育扶贫的一位女同学，她是来自美国的圣母大学，她的名字叫 Rebecca， 很很好听的名字。我看到她的总结报告。他在他的总结报告里写了这样一句话，用英语写 ：“This program doesn't simply gather university students from around the world to teach and serve in China, but instead, the university students are sent to rural locations to learn. The children teach us as much as we teach them.” 我很受感动，我相信参加这样的活动，瑞贝卡和其他的外国学生，包括清华的同学，他们一定把这样一个经历，永远记在他们人生的记忆中。我想，这种全球视野的培养，在学生阶段是非常重要的。第二点，我想讲，未来的领导者要培养自觉的创新意识。创新意识很重要的是，要敢于质疑。要有质疑的勇气，要有丰富的想象力，要努力尝试新的事物，努力用创新的方法解决问题。清华大学也在经历一个迅速发展阶段，我们在持续改革。我们通过科研体制改革，从今年开始，我们加大推动交叉学科的发展。我想这跟创新非常有关系。尤其是强调推动人文艺术和科学的融合，推动我们相关领域的创新思想的产生。我们过去两年也启动了教育教学改革，我们缩小了我们的学分的要求，提高课程的挑战度，让同学有更大的选择余地。同时，我们为广大的同学开展课外科技活动。提供了更大的平台，我很高兴告诉大家，从去年下半年开始，清华大学建立了一个融创意、创新、创业为一体，我们叫“三创融合”的科科外科技平台，叫 i Center， 总面积是一万六千多米。我估计有人告诉我，这是全世界大学里面最大的课外科学生课外科技活动的场所。大家知道，校园的面积是很珍贵的。我们拿出一万六千平米给我们同学使用，有没有效果？当然有效果。告诉大家一个事情，我也很自豪。二零一五年，清华大学计算机系六位本科生同学，他们组织一个科技团队，在课外学习了大量的非本专业的课程，包括基因测序等等、气候变化等等。二零一五年，在全世界三大超算。比赛中，一个在亚洲，一个在欧洲，一个在北美，他们包揽了三项冠军，这是在历史上全世界大学的第一次。今年，因为他们六位同学来自不同的年级，今年有两位毕业了，但是这两位毕业的同学还在清华留下来读博士，所以我希望时代的时候邀请我们两位同学来 s w a t z m a n Scholar 来到 College 来和大家进行交流。我想你们一定会有兴趣，跟他们探讨计算方面的问题。第三个问题，我还还是要讲
，未来领导者要培养深厚的人文素养。一百年前，一九一五年，耶鲁大学的校长，啊不，当然不是沙洛维了，哈德里，啊，他曾经讲过，人文教育的目标就是要培养知识渊博的思想家和出色的公民。我认为，在当今世界，选择越来越多样。培养正确的价值取向，道德情操尤其重要。人文教育要有相应的教育体系对应，要有好的校园文化引导，更要我们自觉的个人的学习和积累。清华大学我们正在努力，啊，采取各种措施措施，提升我们在人文教育方面的实力。包括最近，啊，我是今年在。考入清华的三千多位本科生，大家知道，在中国考入清华大学是非常不容易的。每个人给他送了一本书，是美国诗人作家。我一说你们都知，都都知道，瓦尔登湖。梭罗的这个书，梭罗说这本书是在十九世纪中叶美国工业时代。迅速往前发展的阶段，他倡导人民在浮躁的社会环境下，在物质利用非常强烈的同时下，回到自自然，追问本性。我也希望在当今的中国，中国的经济迅速发展，我们的同学，我们的年轻人也应该静下来。这阅读、思考，这是人文培养环节中非常重要的过程。今年二零一六年是清华大学一百零五周年。基于培养未来的杰出人物，培养未来的世界领导者，清华大学会致力于并为一个更创新、更国际、更人文的一所大学。我相信，一百一十位数十名学者，你们会在这样一个平台上得到教育，你们当然是受益者。但我也相信，我也希望你们也是参与者，共同建造。正如你们说的，热爱清华，一起加入。我们共同努力，建设一个更加开放、更加面向未来的一个新的清华。谢谢大家。啊，谢谢邱勇校长。下面我们有请呃剑桥大学校长 Sir l a t a k Boris， please。Well, ladies and gentlemen, I will revert to English. I'm afraid Mandarin is not one of the uh, languages that I'm able to master. Uh, but I will actually add to that as yet. <laughs> Firstly, my great thanks to all of you for the invitation and the opportunity of being here to share this wonderful occasion with you. From everyone at Cambridge, I want to send my congratulations to Tsinghua University and to Stephen Schwartzman for the visionary establishment not just of this college, but most importantly, of the scholarship program that accompanies it to ensure that a fellowship scheme actually fills these wonderful walls with knowledge and enthusiasm to take this initiative forward. So this is supposed to be a forum on higher education, which I translate rather simplistically in the question that you'd like to know is, what do universities do and why do we do it? is two simple statements. I'm going to revert to something which I'm very familiar with. Many of you from industry and elsewhere are well-versed in company mission statements. They usually go on for pages and pages. They usually have some goals associated with them, but frankly, they're usually meaningless bits of verbiage. Our institution has a mission statement, and it's great because I don't need to refer to notes. It's the shortest mission statement I know, and in one sentence encapsulates everything that we try to do. It stood the test of time. It's been there for well over 100 years, and it's simple. The purpose of the University of Cambridge is to serve society through teaching, learning, and research at the highest international standards of excellence. That's it. It is 
entirely enshrined in those words. And for today, I'd like to pick on three of those words. I'd like to pick on the words society, excellence, and international. What do we mean by society? Well, 800 years ago, as we were founded as a university, dare I say it here as a spin-off from Oxford, um, uh, where our academics did not find the boisterous environment of that institution uh, conducive, they moved to, to Cambridgeshire. Um, what did society mean? It was very similar to the imperial university that was first founded here in Beijing, where the main purpose was to train, I'm using that word carefully, not educate, but train people for the church and the state. They were mostly there to support the policy makers, i.e. very often hereditary rulers in those countries. But that society has moved on. And the society then became the importance of universities to provide individuals with the capacity to provide leadership for democracies and countries as they evolved. So we moved from a local to a national ideal. But the world has got smaller and smaller. And I would now argue that there is only one society, and that is the global society. And every university's aspirations have to be towards that global end. That is, for Cambridge, we serve the global society. And while those words might mean something very specific to us in Cambridge, in spirit, they represent something that would be at the heart, as we have from the president of Tsinghua, whether it's Yale or whether it's Harvard or whether it's Melbourne, it really, those words would encapsulate something of an essence of a university. The second area is around the issue of excellence. We live in a world now which is information rich. Information cascades to us from every conceivable direction. But again, calling on the niceties of the English language, there is a world of difference between information and knowledge. Knowledge is something that is distilled from information. Merely having data does not make you more knowledgeable. To gain knowledge from information is a time-consuming procedure, be it in the humanities or in the sciences. We have to understand what is fact, what is fiction. We have to be able to interpret it, and interpret it in the context of society that is a global society. And if you do this to standards of anything other than excellence, frankly, you end up with an awful lot of rubbish. And the danger is that rubbish can then formulate policy around the world, and we get into an even worse mess than very often the world finds itself in. So for universities, there is an absolute necessity that we have to have that capacity for excellence. And from excellence, we can then create what is really vital, new knowledge. And new knowledge comes from when we distill information into new ideas. So what is it that universities can deliver to you as representatives of the global society? Well, first and foremost, as is the ambition here with the Schwarzman scholars, we deliver people. We deliver people who are not trained now, but who are educated. And there's an old English quote, certainly from the 1940s, now attributed to many people, the distinct difference between what is education. And it's simple. Education is what is left behind when everything you've learned has been forgotten. In Cambridge, we treat this as a mechanism that we get our students, and I know the ambition will be exactly the same here, not about what to think, but about how to think. To get to those very principles where they can begin to distill knowledge from information 
and through that, the development of new ideas. Now, it's not facts that change the world, it's ideas. From my own university examples are legion. When Isaac Newton wrote his Principia Mathematica, now an underpinning thesis of virtually all of global mathematics, it was something that was relevant to a tiny minority. We know how many books were published. There weren't that many copies around of that tome. But can you imagine today building a bridge without calculus? That knowledge stands the test of time. Rutherford, when he described the electron, at that time spoke in his lecture, in his Nobel lecture, to a very limited number of individuals. That particle is the basis of all energy in the world today. And more recently, when Sanger won his Nobel Prize for uh, the study of proteins and DNA, it was an abstract me mechanism of testing chemistry to its extremes, not a vision that has subsequently developed that we can now diagnose diseases well in advance by the use of precision medicine. Or even more recently, because I don't know what the outcome will be, when Stephen Hawking proposes black holes and from that emanates string theory, I tell you what, I'm not clever enough to know what's going to happen to string theory, but I'm willing to bet one of the scholars here is going to do something very clever with it for the future. So let's lastly turn to international. As we've heard already, we are faced with global challenges. I'm going to be bold enough to say that challenges like food security, environmental degradation, climate change are not going to be solved now by any individual, any institution, or even any country. It's going to require the collaboration of disciplines, humanities, and sciences. It's going to require the collaboration of countries, it's going to uh, require the collaboration of many individuals to solve these problems. And these problems are really, really acute. This planet will have 10 billion people. We're barely feeding on this planet 7.5 billion, and that is going to happen in the next 30 years. As a scientist, that means 30 growing seasons or 30 experiments. Just ponder, have any of you ever seen a result that's going to result in that improvement of output in 30 experiments? I can't think of, of, of one. And therefore, the challenge to the scholars here and to scholars worldwide is how do we help policymakers solve those issues? So working together is no longer a luxury or something to be enjoyed. It's an absolute necessity if we're to serve global society. And the scholars here are going to be right at the forefront of those ideas. They're going to be helping to develop those ideas alongside scholars such as the Rhodes Scholars in Oxford or the Gates Scholars in Cambridge working together to try to solve these areas. And those of us of my generation are going to rely on them to ensure that they are able to do this in the world of tomorrow. Because they will be the leaders, they will be the people who will be taking the next generation, that is our children and our grandchildren, forward into a world we can barely imagine today. But the confidence we have to have in them and the trust we have to have in them is given the breadth of education that they will receive. They are the right people to be taking those ideas into fruition so that actually everybody benefits, not just they themselves or the country they serve, but mankind in general. And that is the kind of value that this program and other programs like it around the world seek to achieve. So Stephen and Chinghua, thank you so much for what you have set about to do. I think it's visionary. I think it's something that will add to our global knowledge and to the opportunities that present themselves to a greater understanding between ourselves and a greater understanding of the issues we will all face tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you so much, Boris. Now, uh, let's welcome to uh, uh, our uh, distinguished Minister Zhou, uh, Zhou Ji Wuzhang, to give uh, his speech.
The funding of Swaziland Scholars Program is of great uh, significance to foster, fostering high-end uh, talents with broad international vision and outstanding leadership ability, and will contribute to the realization of Tsinghua University's mission to become a world-class university. Putting education as, the, as a strategic height among national priorities is a critical strategy upheld by China. Given the 1.3 billion population, high quality population will help offer rich human resources, while low quality population will be heavy burdens. Education is the key that we can count on in order to transform the heavy population pressure into rich human resources. In China, it's not only the national resolve, but also people's will to develop and uh, prosper through education. 20 years around the turn of the century, China's higher education has witnessed its transformation from a elite education to mass education. In 1999, the Chinese government announced uh, the important decision of expanding college enrollment. Last year, in, in 2015, the number of fresh students enrolled into higher education institutions reached 8 million. 7.4 times that of the number in 1998. This year, in 2016, more than 7.5 million college graduates entered the labor market. The gigantic human resources have constituted a force contributing to China's economic development and social progress. Whilst achieving the popularization of higher education, how to guarantee the improve and the improve quality remains a great challenge problem. Firstly, we launched the educational quality improvement initiatives so as to improve the educational quality of over 1,200 universities and 1,300 technical colleges. Secondly, we carried out top-class university construction programs. During the past 20 years, China have, uh, has uh, successfully implemented the 211 program and the 985 program, and are currently pushing ahead the double first class program. In 1995, the Chinese government initiated the 211 program and set the goal of building 100 first class universities built to the 21st century. In May 1998, the Chinese government ruled out the 985 program in an effort to build a host of world-class and high-quality research universities. And this initiative was participated by more than 30 universities. The implementation of 985 program and the 211 program has injected a strong vigor and uh, vitality into China's higher education and uh, significantly narrow the gap between key Chinese universities and the world-class universities. However, compared with uh, those world-class universities, Chinese first-class universities still have a long way to go. So, in October 2015, the State Council of China distributed the double first class program. That is the overall plan for the construction of first class universities and first class disciplines, marking a new milestones 
of China in its effort to build first-class universities. President Xi Jinping has also urged to implement the national educational policy. For, for, city, city night, uh, city, uh, for facilitate the transformation of a number of high-level universities and the disciplines into world-class universities and disciplines. First, uh, top-class attendance and uh, yield the first-class research outputs. The best way to push forward the construction of first-class universities is to strengthen international cooperation from a broader global perspective. According to the several opinions on properly carrying out education opening up in the new times as distributed by the Chinese government recently, we must introduce international tenants, carry out high-level academic exchanges and uh, participate in international cooperation. It's necessary for us to build a higher level and a broader cooperation platforms. Swartzman Scholars Program is exactly the very platform we need. We are confident that the funding and the growth of Swartzman Scholars Program will contribute to the Chinese and the world health education, and uh, will play an important role in the peace and uh, development of uh, human beings. Thank you. Thank you, Zhou uh, Bucheng. We next will invite the Yale University Peter Salovey. Peter, it's your floor is yours. Yeah. But in English, Peter Salovey. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here, an honor to be here. I bring deep congratulations uh, from all of my colleagues uh, at Yale University, to Steve Schwartzman, to President Chu. Uh, this is uh, an amazing moment to arrive at uh, and uh, you have all of our profound gratitude for what you're doing for international higher education and uh, for solving the kinds of uh, societal problems that are truly international problems uh, referred to uh, earlier. This is, this is the key. Education is the key. And uh, I'm so pleased to be here and to, uh, uh, to mark this moment. Uh, it's a pleasure to share the stage today. Uh, uh, also with uh, Joe G, with uh, uh, Vice Chancellor Borshevitz, with um, uh, Vice Chancellor uh, Thrift. Uh, and again, of course, President Chu and I are old friends. It's great to see him uh, here uh, today as well. Uh, Yang Bin, thank you for the introduction and uh, for hosting us today. So I thought I would speak a little bit, just for a few moments, on higher education and leadership. This is a theme that I think you're hearing uh, today a good bit. Let me make what's been implicit explicit uh, in my remarks. I think a key question to ask, especially as we consider the ideals and goals of the Schwarzman Scholars Program, is whether universities have an obligation to educate, to produce the world's leaders? I think the answer is yes. I won't review our mission statement, but our mission statement is much like yours. It just took us three sentences to say it. But uh, we want to educate leaders for all sectors of the world. We want to, through that education and through the scholarship and research and preservation and practice of our university, we want to improve the world in the process. But how do you do that? How do you educate 
broadly leaders for all sectors of the world, leaders who can change the world, improve the world in all the ways that my fellow panelists have been referring to. Well, I think a, a key consideration is the importance of a liberal arts education wherever you find it. I think a lot about it in, the terms, in terms of undergraduate education, but we're thinking about it here for scholars coming back, either continuing their education or coming back for further education, but in this same uh, tradition. Before I say a little bit more about that tradition, let me give you an example, an example you will all recognize. And that's uh, Joe Tsai. Many of you know Joe Tsai, he's the CFO of Alibaba. What he shares in common with Steve Schwartzman is he received much of his education at Yale University. And like, as with Steve, we're very proud of Joe as well. What was Joe's favorite class when he attended Yale? Well, Joe Tsai took a class in jazz music from a wonderful jazz musician who uh, is now in his 80s and is still teaching at Yale University. His name is Willie Rupp. And what did he learn in that course on jazz music? He learned to identify patterns. He learned how to improvise. He learned how to play well with others. He learned how to create. In a way, he learned how to solve problems. I think it's also not an accident that Willie Ruff, his professor, together with his fellow musician, Dwight Mitchell, were really the first group to introduce jazz music in China. But there's Zhou Tsai taking this class in, in jazz music and reflecting back on it in the wake of the success of Alibaba and saying, well, it was Yale and courses like that course in jazz music that helped me learn how to think. It helped me learn how to learn for the rest of my life. Yes, he learned core numerical abilities and language skills, but he learned how to adopt them, adapt them, learn how to adapt them to the problems that one finds when one is a leader. Well, I think these are very similar ideas to the ones that President Xi talked about earlier this year when he highlighted the importance of the humanities and of the social sciences in China and suggested that those disciplines together with the sciences are the way in which we educate versatile leaders who can adapt to change and who can address the great global program, uh, problems, the great global problems of today. So leaders of the future are not going to be able to simply regurgitate facts. They're gonna have to learn their they're going to have to use their learning, their skills, their ability to communicate, their intuition, their ability to improvise, their skills as, metaphorically, jazz musicians to devise new solutions for all of us. I think it's terrific that the Schwartzman Scholars Program is rightly focused on learning in this way, in this spirit, but also learning by working together across cultures. Obviously, we value this too at Yale. 30% of our graduate students are international. 11% of our undergraduates are international. Hundreds of students right now on our campus are learning Mandarin, uh, for example. They want to be global citizens. They want to solve problems for the world. Well, as Joe Tsai illustrates, it's not just uh, uh, some of the traditional courses that students take, but it's also these courses in music, in art, in drawing, in film, in theater that are going to contribute to these problem-solving skills uh, as well. At Yale, we think that the opportunities to learn in these ways are unparalleled, but we are not alone here at Tsinghua University in the 
Schwartzman Scholars Program uh, in this beautiful setting uh, designed by Robert Stern, the former dean of the Yale School of Architecture. Just saying, as our students would say. Uh, uh, learning together, uh, taking advantage of these intercultural opportunities uh, 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 is the only way, I think, to be a leader in the future. So we are hoping that the Schwarzman Scholars Program, together with many of the universities represented on this panel, including Yale, are best poised to use the kind of thinking that they will learn, to use the fact that they are being exposed to diverse ideas, to diverse cultures, to diverse perspectives, to diverse challenges, in order to become the leaders who will solve uh, problems uh, for us. We are educating leaders for positions in society that may not even exist today, whether these are uh, uh, positions of leadership, positions of employment, we don't know what they're going to be. And I think it's only through this kind of flexible educational approach represented here today that, uh, uh, that we will uh, educate them properly. Perhaps these students will not just be educated for these positions that we can't imagine, but they will actually create them. So as I've learned more about uh, the Schwartzman Scholars Program, the master's program that uh, the scholars will be uh, engaged in, um, I think it shares much, its values are, have much in common with those of liberal education. The focus on mentorship, on broad exp experiences beyond the classroom, on deep interactions with students across cultures, uh, with other societies, with excellent language instruction, with a honing of presentation and broader communication skills, with learning to work in teams. All of these are going to be the skills that are going to be necessary in the future, and especially for uh, future leaders. We are delighted to be here uh, to help usher in this program, to celebrate Tsinghua University, Schwartzman College, and the Schwartzman Scholars Program to express our gratitude for a, what will become, what is becoming, uh, a, a program in higher education that will produce the leaders who will improve the world for all of us here today, but for our children and our children's children. Congratulations, Steve. Congratulations, President Chu. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for giving me a few moments today. Very proud. Thank, thank you, Peter. So the next one would be Sir Nigel Swift. Gets progressively farther away. So, Steve and Christine, President Cho, uh, distinguished guests, speakers, and of course our wonderful, wonderful scholars. I have to look both ways, I think. Um, I want to make some very brief points about the whole university system uh, around the world, not just individual universities, uh, but actually about the system as a whole. Uh, because the thing I want to start with is the fact that though we have universities like Cambridge and Yale represented here, actually the system of universities has changed enormously over the last 30 or 40 years. Until recently, universities were largely small-scale operations set up to train the sons and daughters of upper and upper middle class elites. Now they are teaching many, many, many more students from the broader middle class and unlike before, in many countries, they're teaching many more women than men. Uh, universities have also changed because of the rise of big science research. They've become the main redoubts of science with a capital S and medicine with a capital M. Uh, and universities have become, whether they like it or not, large economies. Uh, more and more people are employed in them. 
they have more and more turnover, uh, they become economic entities in their own right, and therefore, of course, have drawn the attention of government for better or worse. Uh, then, as universities have grown, they've taken on myriad functions. Managing a university nowadays means running large commercial companies. My last university had 16 of them. Uh, it means fostering startups. It means running overseas campuses. It means seeking out development funding. It means overseeing a vast range of outreach activities. Universities run hospitals, they run schools, they run art centers, they run museums and galleries, they run massive volunteering programs, they run sports programs, the list goes on to infinity. The net result, universities have become something much closer to industries, a fact that most academics deeply hate, let us be clear. Uh, many faculty and students bemoan this issue constantly, but the fact of the matter is, it's happened and it isn't going to go back. The question therefore becomes how we can redesign universities so that they retain their former values, but are also in lockstep with what by default they've actually become. And what I'm going to argue is that they should keep to four main duties, each of which is absolutely obvious, but I think requires some further thought. And I'm going to start with the two most obvious, and that is, of course, research and teaching. In both of these areas, universities have to change whether they like it or not because of the history of the last 30 or 40 years. Let's start with research. Um, university is still, of course, in research, the place where the tradition is meant to be precisely breaking with tradition in order to produce invention. That is the duty of research. There is no other duty than that. But there is more. At the same time, universities have become one of the few repositories of long-term deliberative wisdom in a time when long-term deliberative wisdom is frankly in pretty short supply. Uh, and that's in the face of a planet that has been said by one commentator is, by the way, utterly deaf to our repentances. Uh, in an era in which all sorts of existential threats exist, uh, and we don't need to go through the long and depressing litany, and in the absence of many other institutions willing to actually take up the baton, universities move from commentators, distanced, off to the side, uh, on the issues to being actually centrally involved in them, again, whether they like it or not. Uh, and that's, of course, a serious shift of priority and a much heavier responsibility than has ever been laid on universities before. Universities are becoming something akin to planetary watchkeepers. They didn't ask for this, but actually, I think that's what's happening. To achieve that kind of research imperative requires a lot of things, but in particular, it requires two things which universities are half good at. One of them is much more in the way of cooperation. Uh, of course, there has to be competition, but in the end, it's actually the trick of cooperation which is going to be the most important one which we have to work through. And the other one, uh, obviously, is interdisciplinarity. Uh, everyone talks about it uh, endlessly. Uh, but actually, whether it's really happening, I think, is open to a little more uh, in the way of investigation. Second duty, teaching. The point of the fact is, of course, of course, that uh, universities have always done great and wonderful teaching, but to a small section of the population. Now they're having to do it to much, much enlarged sections of the population, any way you look at it. Uh, this has caused real tensions. Uh, if you look at the way in which universities are regarded, we talk about the top institutions and what they are actually doing. But the bulk of universities are not doing that. What they are doing is training people for jobs. And that is still looked down upon in quite large parts of the system. Let's be very clear about that. And yet, I often think when people say, oh, they're just training people for jobs, it's actually quite important for people to have jobs. I, I haven't come across many people who don't want one. 
Uh, and uh, the result of that, I think, uh, is that we need to think even more about the way in which we train people for jobs than we have currently in many parts of the university system. The third duty is communication. Universities, I think, need to be more communicative uh, on many of the issues that they're concerned with. I mentioned all of these existential threats. The message that comes from universities is often confused uh, and very, uh, um, how can I put it, intermittent uh, in the way that it works. That's been, I think, pretty disastrous in many cases. Uh, let me give you an example, climate change. Uh, surveys show that citizens cared more about climate change 25 years ago than they do now. This is not a triumph of communication. Uh, anyway, you look at it, uh, and I think it's important to note that more will have to be done by universities in a concerted way to make clear what the stakes are. Uh, not just, if you like, scientist by scientist, research institute by research institute. And then I want to come lastly to the accidental duty, which is actually one of the most important things that universities do and that we really don't make enough of. Uh, that is, universities have become increasingly involved, increasingly involved in service to the community. And that service takes place across an extraordinary number of registers. I'm not sure that even people in universities realize how much people in, in universities are actually doing. Um, whenever I have an academic being cynical about the world, and I know you'll find this hard to believe, but it is true, just a few of them are, uh, I can direct them to their own backyard, where staff and students are busy at work on a myriad of projects, mainly but not only small scale, mostly but by no means only charitable, which cover an extraordinary variety of reaching out into the world. From teaching in schools around the world to science outreach, from running hospitals overseas to giving basic health advice, from providing legal aid to pursuing human rights, from the whole gamut of arts and cultural activities to producing film and video, from ecological environmental projects and on and on and on. Uh, and the point with this is that universities have become, with all of these duties, actually a mainstay, a mainstay of global civil society. And I'm not sure that they themselves necessarily realize the extent to which that has become true as other institutions have fallen away. Um, so I think in all sorts of ways, universities need to stand taller than they actually do. Be prouder of what they do, be more aggressive about what they actually do. And it's projects like Schwarzman Scholars which will make that clear. And with projects like Schwarzman Scholars, Tsinghua University, I think, is absolutely on the crest of this wave. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sir Naito. 谢谢刚才五位校长、部长的分享 Mission Statement 他的使命宣言中找到三个关键词的时候，我们看到其中所覆盖的society, excellency和international，其实两个蛮有蛮有呼应。呃，我们看到周部长啊，周也是我们的周校长。呃，其实刚才非常重要的跟我们谈到，今天苏志明项目在这么一个漂亮、呃，伟大的建筑当中能够举办
啊学到的，呃，他特别强调了学习方式本身 ，learn to learn 啊，以及包括啊，他和我们分享到了呃，从习主席讲起，呃，人文社会科学对我们大家成为一个未来领导者的重要性，而 Sir Nigel 啊，他反思了。在动荡的年代当中，大学功能所发生的变化，但也提醒我们，什么是应该找回、保持，而哪些是大学应该补足、改善的。这对我们每一位都有很重要的一些启发。那接下来呢？因为时间有限，我有两个问题，想分两个轮次，呃，提给我们的五位嘉宾。因为刚才几位嘉宾都提到了这个关键词。第一个关键词是啊 ，globalization 或者 international。所以我的第一个问题是关于呃，如果我们希望能够培养面向解决全球共同面临的挑战的未来领袖、未来未来领导者，那么该用什么样的方式，用什么样的办学方式？啊 n i r o 说我们不擅长合作，用什么样的合作方式能够培养出 globalized leader？ 所以我的第一个问题是跟全球化有关。那这个问题，我想有请呃周部长，有请呃 Vice Chancellor b o r i s and Nigel， 你们来做一些分享。哪一位开始 ？How we can prepare truly globalized leaders for the future challenges of the world? Yeah, that's a question. Boris,、um, please. Okay, I think. We need to think very carefully about those two words, international and global. International implies that there are differences with countries. Global implies that we are a unified system. Academic work and academics will inevitably trend towards the global definition, whereby the international boundaries that are actually artificial as far as knowledge transfer is concerned in the world. They are important for political and other domestic issues, but in terms of academia and in terms of creation of new knowledge, they are artificial and can sometimes get in the way of finding real solutions. So, for me, programs such as the Schwarzman Scholars, which try to transcend those boundaries, so that we don't think of this as country by country, but we have mixes of individuals, as Peter talked about in Yale, and we have in Cambridge, and most universities have. We already have a global community. The international set would mean that we were all in little groups in those universities. We're not, so we are exemplars of what global really means, and that, I believe, is the model that will have to take us forward if we're to get the interdisciplinarity that Nigel talked about,、uh, in, that, that is necessary to solve major problems. So that, my position is there is only one position. It's not international. It's global. I think this is a very big question. But I want to talk about the creation of the Schwarzman Institute. The Schwarzman Institute is a very successful training for international students. 一个一个一个方向，呃，我是从这个参加，呃，从当时，呃，索尔斯先生，索尔斯曼先生提出来这样一个概概念啊，实际上就是一个非常先进的一种概念，在新的全球化的时代，现在我们全呃全球的人才，面向国际化的人才啊，全球化的人才啊，这是一个非常突出的问题，首先。就需要互相的深入的了解、深入的学习，在深在各种方面啊，这个有一种系统的、深入的一种人才培养。所以当时从这个项目的提出到这个怎么样来培养这样的人才，怎么样来招招招募学生，怎么样子来招募教师，到怎么样来培养这些学生，我觉得这个苏志明这个呃。学院这个项目，呃，到现在为止啊，我觉得走的一条非常正确的路子。那么我们就是为了要培养，呃，面向未来的，啊，面向世界的这样一种全球化人才的一种，呃，迫切的需求。是哪一种？嗯
My view is that um, what we see at the moment in the world is a whole series of experiments uh, going on to actually produce great global leaders. Uh, some of them uh, will fall by the wayside. The one thing I know is that this program won't. Uh, this program won't because it is properly resourced, one. Two, because it has great people on it. Three, it has great people teaching it. And four, it has every single kind of global influence you could think of in terms of chief executives of companies, uh, in terms of all kinds of people feeding into the program. Those are the ingredients. If you look at it, there are very few places around the world which have actually been able to get to that yet. So as I said before, I think genuinely this program is in the lead. Thank you. Uh,请问你们的演讲当中都有一个,呃,其实在清华这样的一个字眼,这个提到的时候,大家都会觉得非常的,呃,新鲜,那就是都谈到了人文教育或者人文和社会科学对于领导者的这个重要性。那到底我
And uh, first of all, I agree with everything uh, President Chu said, particularly the emphasis on uh, values and, uh, uh, and ethics that one learns by studying the humanities. But what else do you learn by studying the humanities, by reading history, by reading the literature of a culture, by studying philosophy, uh, uh, religion? Well, at least two other things, probably about 10 other things, but let me mention two. One is uh, you learn about how to identify the problems that have vexed humanity over the ages. You learn about discover what's truly important to solve and what isn't. This comes through particularly, uh, I, I think, in, in reading literature. I think uh, in studying the arts and humanities, you learn observational skills. How do you see, I was just reading a piece written by a former CEO uh, of a, uh, an apparel company uh, who was talking about how she developed a uh, uh, her understanding of fashion, and she said her ability to see fashion and appreciate fashion, she said it was through looking at art, and it honed her skills of observation. So that's a second. I said two, but I'll make it three. I think the final area uh, that is developed by studying the humanities is uh, our ability to be competent across cultures. When you've read something of a culture's literature, when you've looked at something of a culture's art, and especially when you've studied with individuals from that culture, and especially if you've had an opportunity to learn that culture's language, you can interact across cultures in ways that are going to be far more effective in solving uh, uh, problems than there would be if you don't have that knowledge. So uh, I think there is no doubt that humanities, studying the humanities, for its own sake, sharpens the mind, makes us better thinkers and problem solvers, but even not for just its own sake, helps us learn how to solve problems across cultures in ways that uh, are gonna be so important uh, uh, in the future. Thank you. I want to add one thing. I want to say that in the human education, the human education is very important. This is... 沙洛韦是上个世纪八十年代提出情商概念的两位学者之一。我很高兴，今年上半年他的《情商》这本书的中文版在中国中国发行了，好像我在替替他推销书。<笑>我想情商确实很重要，因为我确实给他那本书写了推荐。下次我也写一本关于 chemistry 的书，你替我推荐，在美国发行。OK。Boris， do you want to add something？ Um, I can only agree with the points that have been made. Humanities are an integral part of human knowledge. In the University of Cambridge, we do not have a Bachelor of Science degree. Every scientist receives a Bachelor of Arts degree. We do not see the distinction. If I could make one recommendation for absolute necessity of reading for the Schwarzman scholars, is to read the book by C.P. Snow entitled The Two Cultures. C.P. Snow argues in that book that the worst thing that we can do is to create a divide between the humanities and the sciences. It is all about the singularity of knowledge and the contribution that both the humanities and sciences can make together in order to further that uh, space of knowledge. The reason the book is important is that it was C.P. Snow's editor who put the title, The Two Cultures. And our friends in the media use it as a title which describe the divide between the two the knowledges, whereas the content of the book is all about the similarities between the humanities and sciences. And I hope that the Schwarzman scholars in their busy schedule will find the opportunity to read through it because within its pages are contained what I believe is the wisdom as to why the unification of humanities and sciences is the way forward, not the separation into two distinct worlds. So thank you for your reading assignment. Okay, so next one, Nigel. I just wanted to add something to that. The other thing I think that's important to remember, and that many colleagues don't, uh, is that actually at this point in time, the humanities are going through an enormous flowering around the world. If you were to read some commentators, you'd think they were in a disastrous mode. 
Uh, more novels, more music, more poetry is being produced than at any time in human history. Of that, there is no doubt. On top of that, in universities, more humanities students are being taught than ever before. Uh, the number of humanities students in the United States has doubled since 1967. You'd think there'd been a decline. The number of humanities students in the UK has actually increased tenfold since 1967. You'd think there'd be a decline. It, humanities are an integral part of what is going on in the world, and the most important thing is for them to realize it. So, Zhou Zhang. Uh, I, I just say, uh, 清华大学书市民学院的论坛上面来谈这个人文教育啊作为我们这个清华大学的校训但是第二届的苏世民学者项目的招生已经正在如火如荼的进行当中。所以在今天这一个分论坛的最后,我想请五位嘉宾每个人用一句话说给那些想申请第二届苏世民学者项目的申请者听,来说服他申请苏世民学